a, a cool welcome in this <laughs> cooled off room in a very hot Vienna and a very hot Europe um, and a very hot UK. Um, this is the, the, the final event uh, of this semester here at the Institute for Human Sciences. My name is Ivan Weber. I'm a permanent fellow and I run the Europe's Futures Project under the aegis of which we're having this panel. And I'd like to thank uh, Stefan and, and Hans and Nicole for actually suggesting that, that we do this uh, event. And it fits very well into uh, our work and the approach uh, that we have. Uh, it's a three-year project and we're in a strategic partnership with the Erste Foundation uh, here uh, based uh, in Vienna. And uh, we have approached a number of issues. The key ones are democracy and the regression of democracy that we're seeing in various ways in Europe, but more broadly as well. The whole issue of uh, asylum borders and refugees. And we're looking also at the questions of uh, enlargement, uh, in particular to the Western Balkans. Uh, but uh, we have a great lineup here uh, today uh, on this issue of uh, EU and uh, technocracy, and uh, to my far right, uh, Stefan Auer, uh, who is uh, from uh, actually Czechoslovakia or Slovakia, and uh, who's uh, in faraway Hong Kong, where there's been a very serious civic movement. And maybe there's scope for a question towards the end from our colleagues there. Uh, Nicole uh, Shikulina, who is also in Hong Kong uh, teaching. Stefan is the Jean Monnet chair there uh, on European studies. Nicole is also working on these issues. She is uh, from Australia, uh, so she's not too far away from home when <laughs> she's in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, and last but not least, my friend and, and colleague uh, from uh, Chatham House, where he's a senior fellow working on European issues. We were together at the German Marshall Fund uh, working on, on various uh, common issues. Uh, we've agreed that uh, um, uh, our panelists would speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each, and then we'd open it up for a discussion. So welcome all. <laughs> Stefan, please. Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for your kind introduction, and, and thanks for making it uh, possible, at, uh, as you said, we've been in conversation with Hans for quite some time about the challenges uh, that Europe is facing, and one of the key challenges that we want to discuss today is the challenge of technocracy, which we see as the flip side of, of uh, the danger of uh, populism. And, and so I, I will start by raising the big questions, and Nicole will then continue to fill in some detail, particularly from a legal perspective, and, and Hans might uh, suggest some solutions because he's a think tanker. So he, he has answers, which I don't have. <laughs> I want to provoke you to, to think with me. I'm immensely honored and humbled to speak here. I have a great uh, admiration for this venerable institution. I am uh, from Central Europe, and, and this institution has played an important role in bringing together the East and uh, Western part of, of Europe. And I'm also excited to be in, in Vienna, which is a great capital of a great empire of which my country was once a part, right? Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure and, and honor to be here. And I'm not saying all these flattering things just to, to endear myself to you. I, I really love Europe. You know, being so far away from Europe makes me appreciate uh, everything that Europe has to offer even more so. And I'm saying it because what I will present might strike you as uh, Eurosceptic. Uh, but I am a, a kind of a heretical thinker from, from within. I, I passionately support and believe in the European project. I just have some serious doubts about the way the project uh, is, is uh, basically malfunctioning right now. So I just want to highlight some of the key points that I believe are, are uh, the key challenges that, that Europe is facing. And, and my talk, uh, and Nicole to some extent too, is, is based on on, on two papers that uh, one we published together and one I, I authored on my own uh, that just came out. Uh, and I'm just saying it to advertise my own work, but also to, 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 to say that uh, I might, I might uh, push the arguments a bit further than I allow myself in academic work just to provoke you, uh, but that uh, what I say I'm able to, to justify in a more kind of scholarly fashion through, 
uh, those two publications. One came out in the government and opposition, the other one in West European politics, and particularly the one that I published in government and opposition is close to my heart because the journal has the idea of looking at democracy from a comparativist perspective and looking at the role of opposition in, in uh, democracy, which takes me to the first key problem that I want to discuss, and that is that problem that Peter Mayer, uh, the late Peter Mayer, identified some time ago, and he was the editor, actually, of the government opposition, and that is that Europe struggles, uh, that is at European level, the European democracy struggles, uh, with the fact that opposing individual policies or, or policy makers at EU level uh, uh, turns you into a, a Euro skeptic, right? Uh, so so you, you, you have difficulties there uh, that, that are really tricky uh, uh, to address. So I was very, very pleased to have that article accepted uh, by that uh, journal. Just one more preliminary remark. Both my paper and my talk were partly inspired by a fantastic session I was fortunate uh, enough to attend here uh, two years ago when uh, Klaus Offe uh, launched a, a brilliant uh, book, a collection of essays uh, by, the late, uh, um, uh, by the late Ernst Wolfgang Buchenförde. Ernst Wolfgang Buchenförde, uh, Klaus Offe talked about him as a Christian, a Schmittian, and a social democrat. Uh, and I will mention Karl Schmidt today too, so I, I thought I will invoke uh, the late Carl, uh, Ernst uh, Wolfgang Buchenfeld and Klaus Hofer to do so. So I started a conversation then with Klaus Hofer, and uh, one of the articles is my partial response to the issues that we raised then. So this is where I stand. I'm a contrarian and opposed to a number of EU policies, but I'm also passionately committed uh, to the European project. Let me start with a, with a simple proposition. I think in a German-speaking country, it's probably appropriate to quote Brecht, Unglücklich das Land, das Helden nötig hat. So, unlucky, unhappy is the land that needs a hero, right? In German, this sounds compelling. It sounds compelling because, because Germany had too much turbulent history. Uh, so much so that you could, you could, by extension, surmise that lucky is that population that doesn't need politics. In a well-governed society, you know, like Australia, say, where all the basic needs are dealt with, and there is rule of law, we can afford to ignore politics and be happy. And I was thinking of that, of that proposition, in relation to the last elections in, in Germany, that uh, the, uh, the election campaign was, was boring, as a number of observers uh, uh, noted, and that was the second time in the row, because it was clear that the Grand Coalition will again succeed, and the parties actually even pursued their agendas in the most boring way imaginable. So the CDU, the ruling party, had big posters, you know, about Germany, a country in which you can live comfortably, you know, or have a holiday and the like. Yeah? And, and at least one commentator pointed out that that's actually a good thing. Yeah? Joffe, who writes for Die Zeit and who wrote the same article for the Wall Street Journal, it's a good thing, you know, we are comfortable. Look at all the other countries, like Russia or Hungary and all the mess that you see there, or Turkey, you know. We are comfortable, it's a good thing. And I say no. It's not. It's, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's not good because uh, human existence, human, it, it, being uh, political, uh, being a part of a polity, is, is uh, essential uh, to, to uh, uh, what makes us human, right? Uh, and that, that, that statement goes back to Aristotle and, and Alexis de Tocqueville, Hannah Arendt, of course, restated it. So, so I believe it's not only uh, unattainable, that state of affairs, that you can be well governed without taking part in being governed, but also uh, it's uh, not desirable, right? And now in my article, I, I can only sketch it here, but in my article I then extrapolate that this problem is even more pronounced at a uh, European level, right? Where, where any genuine contestation of political issues is next to impossible. And, and Nicole will expand on it by looking at the role that law played in uh, the process of European integration, where many issues that are political by nature and that don't have simple solutions are delegated or turned into legal issues, uh, 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 and that the strategy that we both argued is, is, uh, is just, just uh, wrong, and, and is now actually basically catching up with Europe because I see populism as a flip side to this kind of technocratic approach that the EU has oftentimes adopted almost by, by default. So technocracy is the flip side of EU's failed attempt at becoming a truly political project. 
It is what you get when you want more governance instead of government. I tell to my students that there is an important difference there. Governance instead of government, right? And when you aim at the creation of a post-sovereign, post-national order, when power is perfectly dispersed, which happens with governance, you lose the ability to identify the agency, and that is what all the questions of politics are uh, all about, right? Who did what, for whom, and how? But that means also the loss of ability to hold those in power accountable. So for Europe as a project to succeed, I think Europe needs to reclaim what in German is called das Politische, the political, right? And Carl Schmitt famously theorized it, but I would also bring in Hannah Arendt and Max Weber, who are more uh, defensible in their views uh, uh, than Carl Schmitt. But I find Carl Schmitt's analysis, uh, analysis uh, uh, really penetrating. I mean, Carl Schmitt, of course, an awful, an awful human being and awfully wrong about key issues of his own time, but also awfully brilliant about the weaknesses of liberal uh, democracy and about the relationship uh, between uh, uh, law and, and politics. So I find a lot of his thinking uh, very relevant, so much so that I would say that we are all Schmittians now, which is what I proposed to, to uh, Klaus Hofer uh, two years ago. Uh, he didn't like the idea that much, uh, uh, but uh, I, I expand on it. Uh, one aspect that I find interesting, uh, we are all Schmittian because, uh, because we deal with crises, and, and, and that is what Merkel has been doing, right? Oscillating because the politics of between the politics of emergency and the reliance on, on the rule of rules, right? Uh, reliance on technocratic solutions to, to highly politicized problems. But there is another aspect where Schmidt is relevant uh, that I find uh, somewhat bemusing, and few people seem to be aware of it. Uh, but a lot of those arguments uh, that are in favor of an ever closer union towards a, a quasi-federal or, or a, a supranational quasi-state rely very much on Schmittian's idea of Grossraum, articulated in the Nomos of the Earth and prior to this, this in Land and Sea, uh, in which he argues that in this modern world in which you know, everything is interconnected economically, politically, culturally, it is ne necessary to, to accept the fact that the world will be divided into Grossräume, uh, uh, great spaces in which there are dominant powers. Right? And the EU, of course, it's ironic because the EU is the answer uh, to Schmidt. It's uh, 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 in its essence, uh, the way it understands itself, anti-Schmittian. But when you look at even, even someone like Jürgen Habermas, I would provoke you to think about that, uh, then a lot of what he says really echoes that logic of Grossraum. That the time of nation states, uh, small nation states, is over. We are even told that uh, with Brexit, right, the UK will not survive outside of the EU, which I, 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 I think is a highly dubious, uh, highly dubious uh, proposition. So the key point of my short talk is that the EU is where it is because it oscillates between emergency, the, the politics of emergency, and, and, and the reliance on technocracy, uh, the rule of rules. And, and I will just very briefly list like four cases where I think this logic uh, uh, is at, at play. Uh, the first one is EU-Russia relationship, right? I'm not a fan of Russia. It's a Central European, you know, uh, the history of Czechoslovakia would have been different was it not for the Soviet Union and its expansion, its ambitions, etc. But I, I think it's undeniable that the EU has some responsibility uh, 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 for the mess that uh, Ukraine is, is, uh, is now in. Uh, and and, and uh, the EU's responsibility is that the EU mishandled the relationship with Ukraine and with Russia because it basically acted as if it was unaware of its own power, right? There had been more awareness of geopolitics on EU part would have been helpful. And, and in, in that way, I see the same logic that the EU behaved in relation to Ukraine, to Russia, as a technocratic body without any political uh, sensitivity. And then, of course, Putin uh, took advantage of the fact that there was a power vacuum in Ukraine uh, taking over Crimea and the EU was unable uh, uh, to respond. So uh, uh, there is an article that was published like some 15 years ago that the EU uh, uh, 
believes in the possibility of attaining peace through conversation, right? That is an attack on Habermasian ideal of communicative action. And I think there is a lot to that, and that in relation to Russia and Ukraine, uh, the weaknesses of that approach were, were exposed. The other case, where I think EU at times, time, at times acted as a technocratic body without political acumen, is in relation to the UK and, and, and Brexit. Uh, and then again, uh, I know that what I say uh, is provocative because uh, the UK is not exactly well ruled right now. We still don't know who the Prime Minister is going to be, etc. But I again think that the EU also mishandled uh, the process uh, uh, so far. For me, one, one revealing example is uh, the, the fetishization of the four freedoms uh, uh, in continental uh, Europe. It's presented as some kind of holy trinity, so much so that when David Cameron tried to get concessions, he was told, no way. Uh, Kind of understandable, wrong, I think. Uh, but then even after the UK decided that it leaves, it's leaving, <coughs> uh, Boris Johnson said that it's nonsense, it's baloney, he said, uh, to say that you cannot disaggregate, disaggregate uh, you know, freedom of, of uh, movement from other uh, 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 freedoms. Wolfgang Schäuble, in response, uh, said that he would be happy to provide uh, his majesty government uh, with uh, the Treaty of uh, Lisbon. Right? Very legalistic response to a political challenge. To my mind, completely illogical because the, e the UK wants to leave the EU. So the Treaty of Lisbon will not apply uh, to the UK. But, but that is the default thinking of many key uh, uh, figureheads and politicians in, in Europe. The third example I would use is the refugee crisis. And that, to me, best fits uh, this proposition I'm advancing that Merkel in particular and the EU at large kind of oscillates between the logic of emergency and the reliance on the rule of rules, because there you had a decision that in many ways uh, was noble in its spirit, Angela Merkel deciding virtually single-handedly, uh, even without the knowledge of one of her coalition partners, the CSU, uh, to open uh, borders to hundreds of thousands of refugees. Uh, she didn't think that there would be hundreds of thousands, but that's what happened. And then, uh, then, just a few weeks later, pressurizing EU institutions into adopting a technocratic solution to the problem uh, that I believe became worse through her uh, political actions that she didn't think through, uh, by insisting that all the countries of the European Union uh, would accept uh, refugees. And I know that this, this is uh, a political issue that, yeah, I, I'm happy to come back to it in, in a discussion if people are interested. But there again, I found it um, revealing how Angela Merkel responded when she was criticized uh, uh, for, for uh, the way she handled the crisis. Because you know that one of the turning points was a tweet uh, uh, that uh, was sent with Merkel taking a selfie with a refugee, right? And, and that strengthened the pull factor. Uh, I don't think that that can be challenged, that it uh, greatly strengthened the pull factor, exacerbating uh, the crisis as it then was. And Angela Merkel said, uh, uh, you know, when ich mich jetzt dafür entschuldigen muss, dass ich ein bisschen menschliches Gesicht zeige, dann ist Deutschland nicht mehr mein Land. Yeah? So she presents herself as a, as a normal person, and if she has to apologize now for showing a human face, then Germany is no longer her land. I, I think that is remarkably apolitical to say something like that. She is the Chancellor of Germany. And what she does has impact on people far away uh, from, uh, from Germany. So it was a political uh, action that she took by taking that selfie and, and, and having it spread through uh, uh, Twitter. It wasn't an action of, of an individual. Now, I, I'm anxious about, about time. I, I hope I can speak for three, three yeah. or four more minutes. I want to talk about yet another issue. There's one more obvious example of technocracy and the politics of the exception and, and the rule of rules, and that is the Eurozone crisis. People, people are familiar with that. I, I won't talk about it. Uh, Nicole will probably say something about it, and Hans also. What I want to uh, say uh, uh, before my concluding remarks is the impact that the EU has had on, on Central and Eastern Europe. Again, that is something close to my heart. 
I uh, found, uh, particularly in the 90s, that the EU clearly played a, a very positive role, uh, strengthening the forces of democratization in Central and Eastern Europe, in, in my own homeland, uh, 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 in Slovakia, of course, the, there was the Second Velvet Revolution in 98, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, defeating the autocratic leader, the kind of early Putinist uh, Vladimir Mechiar, right? So I uh, was certainly, uh, uh, until very recently, very positive about the EU's role in Central and Eastern Europe. Today, I have to say that the track record is much more mixed. And I find the metaphor compelling that Attila Ak, uh, a Hungarian political scientist, uh, coined, and that is that what we have seen in Central and Eastern Europe oftentimes is Potemkin democratization, right? And again, then, the EU's impact is mixed uh, because the governments in Central and Eastern Europe uh, seem to have paid more attention to, uh, you know, uh, uh, transmitting uh, EU legislation than engaging with legitimate needs and desires of the population. So there, in that sense, uh, uh, the push towards democratization was somewhat damaged. And in that way, uh, we shouldn't be surprised about the rise of uh, populist uh, leaders in countries like Poland and, and, and Hungary. And again, that is something that we can discuss much more in, 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 in uh, 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 the discussion. But, uh, but I am concerned that the EU has lost a lot of its uh, credibility uh, pursuing agendas that are uh, less, less uh, achievable than focusing on, on the core values that is democracy, the rule of law, uh, uh, human rights. So in, in relation to Hungary, for example, uh, and again, we might have differences on that, but I don't think it's completely illegitimate for a country uh, to have, uh, to desire a control over, over its borders or migration or whatever. I, I do think, though, that the country that completely, that blatantly violates uh, uh, or undermines the rule of law or the freedom of opinion uh, has no place in the EU, right? But the EU spends a lot of political capital uh, pursuing issues that, uh, that are kind of Unachievable. So I, I'm happy to expand on further if, 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 if anyone is interested. But I, I want to uh, conclude by, by uh, recalling a quote by Adam Michnik, uh, who early after 1989, you, you know, the first decade after 18, 1989, uh, uh, there were enough reasons to be positive about the whole of Europe and, and uh, certainly Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, things were moving in the right direction. So Adam Michnik. Uh, said that the story of Central Europe has been like a bad American film because it has a happy ending, right? I like the happy ending, uh, Timothy Gatonesh said, 10 years after that, right, in 1999. Again, still kind of at the height of very positive mood towards Europe and what has happened in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so Timothy Gatonesh cited Adam Michnik. He said, I like the happy ending, but I'm not very keen on the bad American film. Well, it turned out that the story might have been even worse than an American film, right? The plot is kind of becoming more European, uh, more open-ended, which is good. It's in the nature of the political, that we don't know uh, the outcome. Uh, uh, but also probably less, less uplifting, if you accept my, my point about uh, Potemkin's uh, democratization. Uh, so, uh, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I, I do hope that we'll have more time for, for a discussion. I'm keen to hear uh, from people in the audience and, of course, from, from Nicole and, and Hans. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, uh, Stefan, very much. Uh, obviously, I'm sure uh, not only are you a contrarian, but a provocateur also for <laughs> many people in the audience. So I think we'll have a great Q&A session later on. But uh, you've, you've made some uh, crucial points and stated very clearly at the outset, uh, this um, oscillation in the EU between dealing with emergency and then calling uh, upon the rule of law, and obviously this this uh, happy ending that turns into a, a European film with a lot of complex psychology <laughs> <laughs> uh, is is a fitting one for for the times we're in. But let's move uh, to uh, Dr. Nicole. <laughs> Okay, thank you, and, and, and again, thank you very much for, uh, for having me and for arranging this. I'm, I'm going to focus on something that is uh, more specific and, and I'm sure less provocative, uh, and, and that is I want to focus on what is the role of law in the European Union, and that's something that, that uh, is, 
I've, I've, it's, it's been a particular preoccupation of my research. Um, what is the nature of law in general, but then how is it applied to the European Union, which this, this setting beyond the state, because law is so often linked to the state. Um, and, and you know, our specific topic today, of course, is the challenge of technocracy. Uh, and so when we think about the challenge of technocracy, uh, the, the first question then that comes to my mind is law, and again, focusing on the European, European Union, European Union law, as opposed to national law in the member states. But is law part of the problem or is it part of the solution right, to this challenge of technocracy? Uh, and I think that it's both, uh, and, and I'll argue that it's both. It's part of the problem in that EU law and, and the EU's constitutional system, right, so the European Union doesn't have a constitution, but it has, you know, like the UK doesn't have a, a written constitution in the sense that most countries do, but the EU, like the UK, has a constitutional order, it has, it has constitutionalism. But so EU law and the EU's constitutional system uh, has, I think, greatly contributed to uh, the EU's political underdevelopment. Right? So what you have is a very coherent community of law, or what you have had, uh, but it's politically underdeveloped. And, and, and that is a, a product of the fact that legalisation uh, does tend to produce depoliticisation. Right? The EU is very heavily legalised and as a result depoliticised, and I'll come back to say a bit more about that. So in a sense, EU law is part of the problem right, when we think of the challenge of technocracy, uh, but it is also part of the solution because I think that a coherent constitutional order uh, that includes respect for the rule of law uh, and includes protections of, for individual uh, rights is essential for any liberal democratic polity right, not just a state, but, but a polity, right, which, and, and, and the EU should aim to be a liberal democratic uh, polity, or it, it does aspire to be that, it should be that, as well as a club of liberal democracy. So it's part of the problem and it's part of the solution. Uh, so constitutional coherence, I think, is really important, but I, I, what I want to argue is that constitutional coherence is, is precisely what has been lost over the last decade, right, and we can call it the decade of crisis, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm particularly going to be focusing on uh, the Euro crisis. I'm not, I'm not going to go into events in, in any great detail, but, but I'm thinking about the role of law and how the role of law has changed over the so-called decade of crisis. And in the article that, that uh, Stefan and I wrote together that, that, that he just mentioned, um, we, we talk about this transition from integration through law which some of you may be familiar with, which is a, a, th a theory and, 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 and a way in which European integration has been studied, integration through law. I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, but I think there's been a transition from integration through law to something different, which, which I refer to as integration through crisis. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But, but, but crisis itself becomes, in some ways, the driving impetus uh, for further integrative steps, in a way that I think undermines law, right, undermines constitutional coherence. Uh, I, I won't offer much in the way of solutions, uh, I, I, just something general, which is that I would say that, uh, and the key argument that we make in that paper is that law has been overburdened. Law has been asked to do too much, right? Law has been asked to bring about uh, the convergence of very different economies, right, and, and has been asked to paper over pretty significant uh, political uh, differences in political culture amongst EU member states, right. And law is not a functional equivalent of politics. Uh, law cannot be substituted for politics. So law has been overburdened. And, and so part of the solution, I think, needs to be uh, the rediscovery of, of restraint. So I'll, I'll structure my remarks. I'll say something very briefly about the role of law in the EU and then how the role of law has changed in the crisis. Uh, and in the article, we, we use the example of the European Central Bank, which I think <coughs> um, exemplifies this transition. And I might touch on that briefly, but, but it's something we can come back to in discussion. Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll conclude by saying something again about, um, about restraint. So to talk about the role of law in the European Union, there is this traditional story of integration through law, which, which again, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, but the key insight of, of theorists who, who study this integration through law uh, was about the dual nature of law. Right? That law was both the agent of integration and the object of integration. So law as the agent of integration refers to the fact that the process of European integration to a large extent was, was court-driven, driven by the Court of Justice, court-driven constitutionalisation of the treaties, right? turning what are international treaties signed by sovereign states into uh, a quasi-constitution for the European Union. 
and, and I'm not going to go into the details, but again, if, if people have questions. So it's law is the agent of integration, but it's also the object, because the object is uh, a, a tightly bound community of law, a union of people and peoples. And so this is a process led by the Court of Justice, right? And, and in a lot of the literature, the court is referred to as the engine of integration. Uh, and, and what you have in effect, and, and, and many scholars, uh, Karen Alter, who looks at the role of courts, or Joseph Eiler has written about this, um, uh, Alex Stone Sweet, uh, <coughs> notice that some of the, the, the ways in which law has operated, EU law effectively empowers and has empowered individuals, right, vis-a-vis -vis their own government. So individual European citizens are empowered as rights holders uh, and as consumers in the single market. Right, and they can bring actions that w if they feel that their rights are not being upheld by their national governments. So EU law empowers individuals um, and it also empowers courts. I won't get into that aspect of it. And so unsurprisingly, this does facilitate uh, the creation of a tightly bound community of law. Right? And, and uh, not all individuals, but many individuals who are particularly involved in aspects of the single market are well aware of their rights and the legal remedies and make use of them. So. Okay, that's the positive part. But on the other hand, uh, this does not necessarily facilitate, and I think in practice it has not facilitated, uh, the creation of a well-developed political community. And this again is because of what I said before, that legalisation uh, tends to produce depoliticisation, right? That uh, if somebody is trying to assert their rights or vindicate their rights or, or, or pursue their rights, that this can be done through legal channels, this can be done through political channels. But when it's done through legal channels, uh, issues tend to be removed from the political realm. You know, and especially rights issues, and again, we can come back to this you know, in, in discussion, but rights issues that become constitutionalised are then no longer in the realm of political contestation, uh, if that makes sense. So it's no longer something that, that publics and majoritarian institutions that are accountable to publics argue over. It, it's done, it, it's, it's been decided by a court. Uh, it's written in law. And at the European Union level, uh, this is something Dieter Grimm has written about, uh, the, the interpretations of the court are very hard to overrule because of the procedural hurdles to changing European law. So decisions of the court are pretty effectively constitutionalised. Okay, so this is not, you know, a, a bad thing altogether. It has its good and its, its bad aspects. But, but the anti-democratic dimension of integration through law was there from the start, uh, and it's something that's been exacerbated by the crisis. Um, through the decade of crisis, as I said, that, that I conceptualise this as this transition from integration through law to integration through crisis. And so what do I mean? What is, what is integration through crisis? This is, and, and when I mean integration, I mean the further steps that have been taken over the past decade, right? So, so bailouts, firstly, kind of on an ad hoc basis, temporary bailout mechanisms and a permanent bailout mechanism, uh, the, the beginning of a banking union, uh, the, the fiscal compact and things like the European semester. So, so a number of integrative steps have been taken over the past decade right, as a result of the crisis. Uh, but in a way that, that, that really changes the role of law. So, so when I, what I describe as integration through crisis is ends driven, right? It's the ends driven and the end is the preservation of the currency union uh, with its, without losing any members and without turning it into a transfer union. It's extra constitutional. So a number of these measures, like the permanent bailout mechanism or the fiscal compact, were adopted outside of the EU's existing constitutional arrangements right, for various reasons. There's a greater emphasis on coercion in the enforcement of rules, and this is usually done by institutions uh, and or creditor states towards debtor states, a greater emphasis on coercion. And all of this is justified by a kind of emergency rhetoric, okay? So there's no alternative. Uh, it's a very urgent situation. These steps need to be taken. There's not time for a full debate or, or contestation. So integration through crisis doesn't explicitly abandon law, right? Uh, in fact, the rhetoric, rhetoric of rules is really important, right? The rules are the rules are the rules. The rules must be obeyed, right? Uh, uh, Schäuble said something to the effect of electoral outcomes can't be allowed to change economic policy, right? So uh, the rules must be followed by any government of any stripe, right? You can't let the outcome of an election change uh, what a country has to do because the rules are the rules. So we can come back to this, but the question is, is this still law? Is this still even law uh, as opposed to merely rules? Now, I think um, in the interest of time, I won't say much about uh, the, the role of the 
European Central Bank. As I said, in the paper we use it as an example because I think that the expansion of the role of the central bank, the de facto expansion of its role without any change to its legal mandate exemplifies <coughs> this mode of integration through crisis. But um, if people have questions, um, we can come back to that. But so that's the interesting parallel between integration through law and integration through crisis is that both really privilege the role of experts, but different types of experts, right? Courts uh, versus central bankers, right, for example. So what then needs to be done? And as I said, then the, the core argument I think really is that, and it really, you could go back to the Maastricht Treaty and, and the creation of economic and monetary union is, is that law has been overburdened. Uh, and this is something that, for example, Kristen Jurgis has written about in the design of the economic and monetary union, of course. The economic and monetary union was to be held together by certain formal rules about levels of debt and government deficit. Uh, and this created the illusion of law, and this is, he's quite critical of this, that it's, it's not law, it's the illusion of law, that rules, legal rules, just cannot bring about that kind of economic convergence. Right. You, you, you can't just write these rules and, and it's just going to happen. So it was always the case that, that uh, the EU institutions, that the member states were asking too much of law. Right? And, and I suppose we're all wise in hindsight. Uh, but, but, but there were people who, who looked at these problems um, uh, with foresight. So law has been overburdened since the Maastricht Treaty, since the creation of the Economic and Monetary Union. Uh, and and I, so I think what is needed is the rediscovery of restraint. Um, and so I think I would, I would end by coming back to this question of what is law, right? What makes it law? And, and there, there was uh, one of the leading American legal theorists of the 20th century, Lon Fuller, who he, 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 he had a number of uh, principles of legality, eight, eight principles of legality, right? So there is a difference in this view between just merely rules and law, right? Law should uh, adhere to certain principles of legality. He had eight of them, which some of them are pretty straightforward. Law should be uh, general, it should be publicised, right? So people know what the law is. It should be prospective, not retrospective. So kind of normal things you associate with the rule of law. But the one that I'm, I'm interested in and, and would like to draw your attention to is that, you know, that law should not make impossible demands upon its subjects. Right. And, and that, I think, has been lost right, in, in this overburdening of law. And that's what I mean by restraint uh, uh, in, in, in the creation of new legal rules, that law should not make impossible demands. And I think, to a large extent, that was done uh, in the Euro crisis. Uh, impossible demands were made of Greece, uh, of Italy. Um, arguably, if you want to pick a different issue uh, with the refugee crisis and this, this controversy about um, the compulsory quotas right, and the adoption of that decision, that, that arguably that also is not the kind of demand that law should be making upon its subjects. Um, and, and so as I said, I, I don't have clear solutions. I guess I'm raising more questions than offering answers, but um, I, I will leave it there. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Um, as, as Stefan said, you went uh, into greater detail on, on some of these issues and again raised many questions that I'm sure we'll address, uh, and uh, as Stefan said, uh, Hans has all the answers now. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, um, Ivan, for making this happen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you, Stefan and Nicole, for, for suggesting this, um, this discussion. The slight problem with the panel, I think, is that we all agree a little bit too much. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, like Stefan, uh, I'm a bit of a disillusioned pro-European um, as well. Um, uh, and so what, what I'll try to do slightly to um, say something different to Nicole and, and, and Stefan is first of all to try to say something about what, how, um, what's happening in the EU um, it fits into the rest of the world what, in a global context. I'll say something about the debate about populism, which Stefan has already mentioned, and, and how th this connects, how the problem of technocracy connects to populism. Um, and then I will try to say something um, about solutions. I'm not really going to give any answers, but I'll try to sort of put my finger on what I think is the crucial question, as it were. Um, so let me start, as I say, by saying something about the global context, um, and, and in particular to sort of ask the question, is 
um, the trend that Stefan and um, Nicole are describing, which I very much agree with and think is a huge problem. Um, in other words, this kind of replacement of politics by law, depoliticization, um, technocracy. Um, is this a global phenomenon or is this a specifically European problem that has to do with the sui generis nature of the EU, you know, as, as people often um, say? Um, my answer to that is that, um, I mean, it's a slightly complex answer, it's that it's an extreme example of a general trend. Um, and the reason for that is because I think this, um, where all of this comes from, um, this sort of proliferation of rules, um, it's essentially a function of integration and of deep integration uh, in particular. When you have international integration, you need rules to govern that integration. Um, and because the integration has been even deeper, in other words, has gone even further within the European Union than it has in the rest of the world uh, in the context of globalization in the last um, 30, 40 years, it seems to me this regime of rules has also had to be developed um, much more. So if you think about this in terms of, say, globalization, if, if one thinks of globalization as the removal of barriers to the movement of capital and goods and people, then clearly that process has gone even further within the EU than it has in the rest of the world in the last 30, 40 years. You see this particularly, by the way, on the question of the movement of people, in other words, migration. Um, there, um, there's, a, there's a big discrepancy, I think. Um, you know, the removal of barriers to the movement of capital and goods has gone quite far in the whole of the world in the last 30, 40 years. But um, freedom of movement as a principle um, you know, has gone much, much further within the EU than it has in the rest of the world. Um, and you see this very clearly in the UK, where, for example, um, you know, it's now infinitely easier from some for somebody from Bulgaria, I mean, until Britain leaves the EU, um, um, it's infinitely easier for somebody from Bulgaria to come to the UK um, than it is for somebody from, say, the Indian subcontinent, you know, former British colony. Mm. Uh, my father's from India. Um, historically, it was the other way around. It was much, much easier to come from former British colonies to Britain. Now that's been reversed as a consequence of the way that freedom of movement um, has worked um, in the EU. So it's an extreme example of this, of this general global trend, but I think we have to emphasize it's only happened in a regional context. Um, it's, it's only within the EU that you have this very extreme removal of barriers to the movement of capital and goods and people. So Danny Roderick um, has um, described the sort of global version of this as hyper-globalization, you know, over the last 30, 40 years to distinguish it from the earlier sort of much more moderate phase of globalization. I think the way to think about what's been happening in the EU is hyper regionalization um, as a kind of a, a as a kind of a counterpart to that now that brings me to um, the debate about populism um, because that's also seen often as being um, a broader Western or even sometimes as a global phenomenon um, you know we're told that there's this populist wave throughout the West and perhaps throughout the whole world um, and in particular it's often seen as a reaction to globalization this is the losers of globalization uh, now, I don't like the term populism um, for several um, different reasons, but in particular because it seems to me that it implies that this huge range of um, f figures, movements and parties, and even, by the way, in the case of Brexit, a decision, um, are kind of the same thing. There's this implication that the same thing is happening everywhere. Um, that, you know, Trump is the same as Brexit, is the same as the Front National, the AFD, and the same as Fidesz in Hungary. And that's just talking about the West. You know, some people would even include Modi in India. You know, it's extraordinary how this, this term has been used in such an inflationary way. So, in other words, it seems to me that it obscures the heterogeneity of what we call populism. Actually, the differences between these different figures and movements and, and people um, are actually, I think, as important, um, if not more important, than um, the similarities. Um, and, um, however, give it, despite all of these differences, it does seem to me that there is something that connects um, all of these different um, figures and movements and parties that we call populist. And that's that they are, it seems to me, um, a backlash against different aspects of hyperglobalization. Um, and that actually works in quite a, fun, a, quite a predictable way. Um, the, the different kinds of populism you get, um, left-wing populism, right-wing populism, creditor country populism, debtor country populism, insider, you know, a, a populist revolt by insiders, a populist revolt by outsiders. You can actually predict, um, based on the political economy of countries in Europe, 
what kind of populism they're going to produce. There's nothing really mysterious about this. It's a fantastic book, which I recommend by Philip Manow, a German academic, Die Politische Economie des Populismus, which shows this very, very clearly, um, that this isn't particularly um, mysterious. It's really a function of political economy. Um, now, in particular, it seems to me that populism in these different ways um, is a backlash against the way that in this context of hyper-globalisation or hyper-regionalisation, hyper-Europeanisation, -European, decision-making has been moved further and further uh, away from the citizen as um, areas of policy have, as Stefan and Nicole have been describing, been taken out of the space of democratic contestation and rules have been created to govern these, um, these um, areas of policy, particularly economic um, policy. Um, and so um, it seems to me you do have this particular phenomenon of depoliticization. Christopher Bickerton, who's another um, very, very interesting academic who's been working in the same area, writing very interesting, uh, very interestingly about this problem of technocracy, talks about the triumph of law over politics um, or the sort of triumph of the constitutional pillar of democracy over the popular uh, pillar of, of liberal democracy. Constitutionalization is another term that's used to describe this, as Nicole mentioned, um, or quite simply um, uh, technocracy. So it does seem to me that there's a way in which, um, as Stefan hinted right at the beginning there, um, there's this kind of quite intimate relationship between technocracy and populism that in a sense technocracy produces populism. Um, I do wonder in particular, and actually this is an observation that, um, that, that I originally heard from Ivan Krastev, um, one of your fellows, yeah. um, that in particular neoliberalism um, you know, which is very much part of this story of the development of hyperglobalization and technocracy, <laughs> that neoliberalism spe specifically produces identity politics um, because the moment um, you take economic policy out of the space of democratic contestation and there is no alternative on economic policy, then inevitably political debate shifts to these culture issues. Um, and I, see, I think you see this probably most clearly I in the United States. Um, so, um, the question, and this is, this is where I'll, I'll end, um, the question it seems to me um, is um, really how we draw the balance, where we, where we draw the line between um, uh, these constitutional and popular pillars um, of, of democracy, <laughs> or to put it in the context of, you know, in terms of globalisation, the question I think is where you do move ahead with deep integration and create international rules to govern those areas of policy and where you retain autonomy at the level of the nation state. So Danny Roderick, um, in an op-ed the other day, which I highly recommend in Project Syndicate, talked about the dividing line between policy domains in which nation states are free to do as they please and those that are regulated by international agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you draw the line? And has the EU gone too far, perhaps, in that and needs to perhaps dial it back a bit? Um, has the rest of the world gone too far, as Danny Roderick would argue, and, and needs also to go, to go back a bit. But the question in any case is where do you draw that line? Now, I think this is an, I don't even know how to begin thinking about where to draw that line. The, uh, you know, one way to start would be to say, well, look, the rules that seem to be particularly problematic are those that have distributional consequences. In other words, ones that create winners and losers. Those areas, it's not just that they should be within the space of, of democratic contestation. They're the essence of democratic contestation, is these distributional questions. That's what politics is there to do. Um, so that would lead you to sort of say, well, you know, we shouldn't have rules on economic, um, on, e on economic policy. But it's precise, you know, globalisation is to a large extent an economic phenomenon, and that's precisely where you need the rules. Um, also, the European Union from the beginning was about economic policy, you know, beginning with the coal and steel community. It's not as if that only came at a later stage in European integration and that's when things became problematic. Even in the earlier stages of the European Union, which I think we would all agree, um, you know, functioned more effectively, it was still about creating rules on economic policy. So, um, so, as I say, I don't really have an answer to that, um, except that I do think we need to think about where to draw the line and perhaps a place to start would be to think about rules, um, uh, international agreements and rules that enhance democracy as opposed to those which undermine it. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Hans, very much. That was quite a, a tour de force. Um, my immediate thought is that, in fact, uh, rules have been completely abandoned in the financial markets with the deregulation and kind of the sausage making with subprime loans and kind of, you know, you're free to do anything you want, so abandon all rules. But anyway, 
I will uh, refrain from my impulses to ask questions and comment and open it to uh, the floor here. And so please uh, do uh, introduce yourself as you ask the question. I will go to the gentleman right there and then to Mary. And we'll collect two or three questions. Uh, thank you very much. That was, for me personally, unexpectedly very exciting, actually, <laughs> um, because usually the word technocracy doesn't instill a lot of emotions. Uh, my name is Adam Yurosovich. I'm an associate fellow at the Austrian Institute for European Security Policy. I deal with China, something completely different. But um, um, my question was related to the Western Balkans in this case, namely, um, Having spent quite a bit of time in Serbia and uh, Montenegro and Albania during the demonstrations recently, a lot of people who used to be very much in favor of the EU are basically calling precisely this technocratic nature out when it comes to the, the, popula the popular pillar of democracy now standing up and saying, well, there's all these issues with uh, media freedom and so on, and all we get from the Commission are very sort of dry, legalistic answers and no genuine support. Um, perhaps uh, you could comment on that, whether that this also ties into what Stefan said at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mary? So, I'm Mary Caldor uh, from LSE, but a long time ago when I worked with Ivan, I was the Jean Monnet reader <laughs> in European studies at Sussex many, many years ago. Um, I really agree with all of you about the technocratic nature of the EU and about the fact that populism is the flip side of technocracy. I have no disagreement. The question is which comes first. I mean, yeah. I feel it's been the ab something Spinelli said throughout his life. It's been the absence of political engagement with the European project that has produced a very legalistic rules-based system rather than a legalistic rules-based system depoliticizing. That's, that's what I would argue. Um, and from the beginning, there was this idea, the famous Monet method, that there wasn't a kind of European political community, but it would come about through these measures. Through crises. Yeah. Well, he thought that by he thought it would come about by solidarity, by bringing economies together. Gradually, people would come together. And actually, as you, as as Nicole was thinking, I was thinking that of something Ulrich Beck said, where he said, you know, the economic and monetary union, which everyone said was crazy. You know, you can't have a rules-based economic and monetary union. You can't have it without a political, without a common budget, without a common taxation system, without a common polity. It wasn't a mistake. It was just a continuation of the Monet method. Mm. Sooner or later, yeah. he thought it would bring about politics. And in a curious way, that's the only area I disagree with. I think that is beginning to happen. <laughs> um, and I mentioned two things. First of all, Stefan was rather critical of freedom of movement. If I look at the debate in the UK, the young people who overwhelmingly support the EU think of themselves as Europeans. And they think of themselves as Europeans because they've been free to travel, work, study, fall in love across Europe. And so freedom of movement has been absolutely critical in, 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 in a sense. And this is something we did a study a few years ago. People didn't talk about Europe, Europe, but when you pushed young people, they just took it for granted. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that I think Brexit, paradoxically, has produced a new kind of politicization. <laughs> it certainly has in Britain. Uh, where there's a whole new group of people who are fantastically interested in the European polity. Um, but I think also the reaction, on the one hand, the reaction of the right-wing parties to saying we don't any want, longer want to leave Brexit has meant there's new, now a political fault line within the European Union. Instead of the debate being about should we be outside or should we be inside, 
the debate is about do you want right-wing populists or do you want an alternative? And I think from this perspective, the recent European elections were actually, with the exception of Britain and Italy, I would say, with the first elections where people have been engaging with the European political project rather than treating it as a sort of proxy for national issues. And the PES came out with a much more radical policy than they'd ever been before, which was challenging neoliberalism and technocracy. And so I think there is a beginning of a politics. And the way to think about it is not to think about how to adjust the rules, but how that political community can be constructed. OK, back to the panel. Stefan, do you want to? Thank you. They're, they're bro both uh, uh, brilliant questions. I'm genuinely grateful because they, they helped me to elaborate on, on some of the points that I raised. But I, I, I should say from the outset, uh, uh, with all due respect, I, I'm probably on a different uh, end of that spectrum. I'm, uh, I'm going to completely uh, contradict you. So I'm in complete disagreement with Ulrich Beck and, and, and Jürgen Habermas, as much as I admire uh, the work. And I, I will start by commenting uh, on uh, what Hans uh, used to finish his contribution uh, with. Because you mentioned democracy, and, and I didn't say much about democracy. And I should say that as much as I love Europe and the European project, my primary commitment is to democracy. I grew up in a communist a country, I now live in a country that is far from being democratic, it has the rule of law, Hong Kong, it's not even a country, a place that has the rule of law and strives for democracy and will, it's unlikely to achieve it in my lifetime. But my lifelong preoccupation is to how to maintain the conditions of liberty, which was Arendt's preoccupation, right, democracy. And, and the more I think about it, the more I'm doubtful uh, that you can get away from the question of scale, the appropriate scale for democratic governance. And my fear is that Europe went too far. It's too ambitious in its scope, right? And, and I, I, I just have been traveling through Europe, coming from Hong Kong. We stayed here for a couple of months. We were in the uh, Basque country, in, in Bilbao. We talked to colleagues there at the university. They all talk about local politics and local issues, right? We have the issues in uh, Catalonia. Wherever you look, politics is is uh, local. So what Ulrich Beck and Jürgen Habermas have envisaged and have argued for, I think is unachievable, perhaps also undesirable. And the point you made, Hans, uh, uh, at the end, that, uh, that uh, neoliberalism uh, produces identity politics. Yeah. That it, it gets worse, I think. Liberalism has the tendency to produce identity politics because liberals uh, uh, are still struggling to make peace with nationalism. So the, the first uh, work that I did, my doctoral thesis, was about liberal nationalism in Central Europe. I, I think liberals need to reclaim nationalism because politics is local and it is about national attachment. So I, I started with uh, this quote by Brecht, yeah, that lucky uh, uh, is the country, uh, uh, that lucky is the nation that doesn't need heroes. And I think in Europe, uh, the elites came to uh, think that uh, lucky is a society that doesn't even need to be a nation. It doesn't even need to be a nation. We can be all Europeans, right? Uh, it hasn't worked that way. It really hasn't worked that way. And just one point about the freedom of movement, because I should clarify that. I am not opposed uh, to the freedom of movement. I am opposed to the idea that it became like the Holy Trinity, a religious dogma that you can't even question, that you can't even adjust. So the point you made, for example, about what it means to young people, I think it's fantastic. And, and I think it's perfectly feasible uh, to maintain that policy uh, to young people. I, I understand that the UK has had, I don't know whether it still has, that kind of policy towards Australians. Young Australians can go uh, to the UK and experience it and live there and work there and, and whatnot. You could probably have that across the whole of Europe. But Ivan Krastev made this argument in a compelling way that what the freedom of movement has done to, to countries in Europe, particularly the countries that produce migration, less so those that accept it, has been unbelievably uh, uh, like, like bad, right? Like <laughs> Bulgaria is basically being depopulated. That is a very serious policy issue yeah. that cannot be even uh, discussed because you touch on the religious dogma of the indivisibility of four freedoms 
uh, uh, which wasn't uh, uh, the idea uh, from the outset, right? It only became an established wisdom in Europe amongst the elites of Europe in the 1990s, and now even when dealing with the UK, they say, oh, no, no, you can't have one uh, without the other, uh, they are indivisible. So I just think uh, what we need to reclaim is this kind of, it's all on a scale, and scale matters. So what is the appropriate size of political community? And not that you decide everything at the level of the Catalan government or Spanish government, but there are certain uh, competencies that, that should be reclaimed to a more local level. And, and then the freedom of movement. It's not all or nothing. There was freedom of movement yeah. uh, before uh, uh, this religious dogma, so yeah. the religious dogma was, was adopted. It was a freedom of movement for workers. So I can well imagine that Europe can function well and everyone can be happy with the freedom of movement of labor plus the freedom of movement for, for young people. There are thousands of possible policies, but the problem is that it cannot be even discussed, because in, in Brussels you would be considered a populist whatnot, I don't know, a monster, right? So, so they can't even be discussed. That, I think, is damaging to democracy, because I don't think that the freedom of movement, as much as it is laudable, is indispensable for democratic governance. What is indispensable is the robust rule of law, and a protection of uh, basic rights and the uh, freedom of opinion, etc. Other things are, are, if we can make them work, yes, but but they haven't worked. Hans, you want to? Yeah, well, um, I, I have a slightly different take on um, what's happening in Britain than you do, Mary, and, and also on freedom of movement. I'm probably a little bit closer to what Stefan said, but I don't want to make this a debate about about Britain. Um, but I, I wanted to, like, your question about the causality, I think, is really intriguing. Like, does, does populism produce technocracy or does technocracy produce populism? That, I think, is a really interesting question. And how does this all fit into the history of the EU? Um, and I don't really have a good answer for you, and I want to think about it some more. But what strikes me is that I think all of us agree that there was, there's been a certain sort of qualitative change in the way that the EU functions, particularly since Maastricht, the single currency. Um, so there's been this kind of somehow corrosion of the European, or distortion of the European project. At the same time, um, I wonder whether to some extent um, what we've been describing, this depoliticization, has been central to the EU from the beginning. Yes. Um, and so I'm really struggling in a way to sort of reconcile those two things and answer your question because I mean, in a way, is this not the essence of European integration, um, is to take areas of policy yes. out of the space of democ democratic contestation and to create rules to govern them? In other words, depoliticization, which it seems to me is both the genius of the EU and its, fa and its flaw now. You know, the, the reason it's, it's the genius of the EU is because this strategy um, at the beginning, you know, was meant to prevent war between France and Germany. And, you know, in, in that context, depoliticization is good because international politics can lead to war. Um, and so, you know, if, if that's the challenge, then you can see how depoliticization makes sense. But um, it seems to me as the project developed, but also as our societies changed, um, you know, so two things are happening at the same time. On the one hand, integration has progressed further and, and, and become more intrusive in a way, and, and the, you know, the, the nation state has been constrained more. At the same time, it seems to me, and I don't know if these two things are related, our societies have become less deferential hmm. and have therefore been demanding more democracy and more responsiveness at a time when decision-making is being taken further and further away from the citizen. Um, so I suppose, you know, it's a very long answer and not a very good one, but my instinct is that actually it's not, you know, it's not that, you know, populism has produced technocracy, it's more the other way around. This also, though, links to, you know, something that Stefan said, and, but then also the question, was it Alex? Is that your name? Adam. Adam, Adam. sorry. Um, about... Um, sort of the size of political communities, but also since you, brought, since you said you work on China, um, mm. I think this is kind of interesting. Um, I, it reminded me immediately of something that a European diplomat said to me the other day, which is that you know, beyond Europe, where you know, the EU now is sometimes competing with China, 
um, you know, in Central Asia or Africa to some extent. You know, it, it, he said that, you know, the, that China comes with a checkbook and the EU comes with the rule book. Um, you know, coming back to our discussion um, about rules. Um, and the reason I mention that is because it seems to me that there are now these two sort of countervailing pressures um, on Europe. On the one hand, um, because of the rise of China, there is the temptation, the Schmittian <laughs> temptation that you mentioned, Stefan, this pressure towards having bigger units in order to be able to compete with other mm -hmm. continent-sized powers like China and the US and so on. And this is obviously the argument that pro-Europeans always make. Remain has made this argument in the UK. We have to be part of a big unit, otherwise we just can't survive mm -hmm. in this new world. But at the same time, there's a countervailing pressure, it seems to me, you know, sort of bottom up rather than top down, you know, coming from within our societies rather than, you know, <coughs> geopolitics, which is pushing us towards smaller units. And that, I think, has to do with this, you know, end of deference, demand for, for decision making to become closer to the citizen. And it's, it seems to me you're pulling in two completely different directions. And I think that part of the Brexit debate is that Brits are drawing a slightly different conclusion about this than continental Europeans are. So I'm very struck by how you have these two debates about sovereignty mm -hmm. completely disconnected from each other. In continental Europe, you have this debate about European sovereignty, which is basically about state sovereignty and about you know, competing with China and the US and so on. In other words, European power in the world. But it's, it's kind of about state sovereignty, even though the EU is not a state. Meanwhile, in Britain, it's as if we don't care about that stuff anymore. We're having a debate about popular sovereignty, you know, not about state sovereignty, but who governs, um, you know, and, and how you, you know, it's as if we, we sort of ceased caring about this role that Britain traditionally played, punching above its weight and, and so on, um, and helping, helping to sort of shape the, the world. Um, we just focus on making our democracy work. Um, and it's very striking, I think, the disconnect between um, these two debates. Um, if Britain is tending to sort of slightly ignore the, the, you know, the sort of reality of power in the world, I do have the feeling that continental Europeans um, and pro-Europeans in particular are not really engaging with these questions around popular sovereignty. Cool. Yeah, oh, I'll be much uh, briefer, I think. Um, Sorry, I took <laughs> That Firstly, on the question about the Western Balkans, which is itself another area where you know, China's coming as well with the checkbook, right? Yes. Um, so so yeah. that's interesting. And, and I think it it, it, it it really goes to one of the key things that we're talking about. So what is the EU trying to achieve in the Western Balkans, right? And there's kind of different levels of goals. There's the geopolitical. It's important to keep these countries within the European sphere and, and you know, not let, not cede ground entirely to Russia or China, etc. So there's the geopolitical level. But there's also, you know, there's, there's Europe as the peace project, Europe as, as expanding the de zone of, of democratisation, right? So there's this desire to genuinely support the democratisation process. Um, and, but this then, you know, it, it, it does go to the fact that, that in how then the EU goes about that, that it, it does inherently tend towards this technocratic approach. So how do you support this genuine democratisation, right? Through rules, through the key, through these kind of very detailed uh, procedures which need to be adopted, I mean, for, for member states that joined more recently, you know, the, the, the process involves adopting a great deal of law in a way that's not particularly democratic because you don't have enough time to properly debate everything. Also, it's take it or leave it uh, mm. if you want to become a member. So, yeah, that's ironic. It, it's ironic. And I, I don't know what, um, what the solution is uh, there. But, but, yeah, you're right. So, in a way, that, that kind of uh, triggers a backlash, which is also then fueled by the by the enlargement fatigue and, and, and the feeling then that these states aren't wanted. Um, I actually, if I can just pick up on, on, on um, of one aspect of, of, of what, um, uh, what, what Mary was saying is that I, I kind of agree actually that potentially the politics is coming. I also agree that, that the most recent European elections were a good sign. So I don't think it's all you know, doom and gloom, everything in the EU is terrible. Uh, I always show, you know, so I teach European Union studies in, in Hong Kong and the students prior to taking the subject know very little and it's a lot to try to explain. But I always, uh, we always touch on the so-called democratic deficit and, and the problems of democracy. And I always show the chart of the uh, European parliamentary election turnout, right, and, and that it declines, right, with every election it declines. 
Uh, and, and so finally, this election bucked the trend, not in, not in every country, obviously, but overall. Um, and I actually think that is a positive. So, so some people have made the argument that that populism is uh, good for the EU because it is provoking the kind of politicisation that's needed. So I don't know about that, but, but yeah, potentially the politics is coming. And so if people are finally voting in the European parliamentary elections because they've thought about European issues and they're voting on European issues and it's not just a second order election, then I think that is a good thing. Um, whether Brexit has produced a kind of uh, positive politicisation, I, I'm not... I, I used to be based at the University of Birmingham um, and I, I was based there at the time of the referendum and, and I left shortly after, so I haven't been there for a couple of years, but it just seems, observing from afar, that it's a really... it's, it's a politicisation, but it's a really kind of toxic, polarised politicisation. <coughs> so whether that's as positive, uh, I'm not sure. But so if politics is coming, I think there are some things that need to be nurtured. But the EU could do better. So, so the current debacle that is the Spitzenkandidaten in process, <coughs> right? Mm. It's politics, but it's like, it's the bits we don't like about politics. It's, it's the, the bits where individual political figures are putting their personal gain, right? And, and this, this politicking above the, the greater good or the public good. So that's a total missed opportunity. And then the EPP, I think, is being extremely cynical in, in framing the fact that they're not going to get their candidate as... You know, they've got this Twitter hashtag, respect my vote. And, and you know, I mean, as if anyone voted for Weber to be commission president. So that's a wasted opportunity, you know. So the EU needs to do better. If politics is coming, the EU needs to do better to nurture that. Uh, yeah, just, just briefly on this question of whether the politics is coming and whether this is a good thing. Let's say, you know, the turnout in European Parliament elections, you know, continues to go up. And in that sense, people become more engaged. It's not clear to me that this is the kind of politicisation we want if the fault line along which people are fighting is basically mm. a pro-European Eurosceptic fault line. In fact, this is the argument that Peter Mayer makes in that piece yes. on opposition in the EU. Yes. There's something weird about this. Um, it, it seems to me it, has, it should be um, on a left-right kind yeah. of fault yeah. line. And that I, I see no yeah. indication that that's happening. So, so, so for, for example, I mean, my test of, of, of you know, if you look at the, the, the European elections that have just happened, mm. What should have happened if this had been a properly functioning, you know, politics, I think, is that Merkel and Macron would have been at each other's throats offer and they would have been offering alternatives to each other, where basically Macron is saying, I want redistribution in the EU, and Merkel is saying, I don't want redistribution in the EU. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that would be promising to me, because it seems to me then you could move beyond thinking about these fights around the Euro crisis as being a battle between Germany and France, mm -hmm. or between North and South, which is quite toxic, you Know, and it mm. takes us back to previous you know, European conflicts. If we could start to think about this in left and right terms, mm. um, um, you know, then that would be a good thing. But actually, Macron, you know, his, act, his entire strategy in the European elections was to avoid doing this and to say, no, I agree with Le Pen that this is a completely binary battle between you know, um, globalists and nationalists, between liberals and illiberals, mm. between centrists and populists. Merkel's on the same side as me. Well, well, it's, I think it's complicated because he, it's a, it's a, I think what he's trying to do is pursue a right-wing policy at a domestic level in order to do something left-wing at a European level. So, you know, he's pushing through structural reform in France, um, you know, in order to impress Germany and get some credibility so that he can actually do re more, a more redistributive EU in which there's real solidarity. So in that sense, I think of him as being on the left. I, I agree with you, domestically, you have to think of him as being right wing. But my point is that he's obscuring these left right fault lines, which, you know, I think is the direction we should be going in rather than clarifying them. Well, he's, he's trying to be catch all in yeah. some dimensions. Yeah. Okay, let's do a second round of uh, right here. Just wait a second for the microphone. And do introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Phil Howe, uh, Adrian College, up until last month, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and a uh, former Urias Fellow uh, right here. <laughs> um, this question is sort of directed to Hans's third point about uh, solutions, mm -hmm. though actually I'd like to hear everyone's response. Um, it seems to me there's a consensus here that some level of technocracy is necessary and even good, but that it's sort of taken over, that it's gone too far. 
And it also strikes me that there's several justifications for technocracy being offered. The primary one being emphasized is that it promotes rule of law. And to some extent, I'm hearing people talk about technocracy as sort of meritocracy or competence. But I'd like to suggest that there's a third justification for technocratic institutions, which is an indirectly democratic one. We use them to restrain ourselves. Um, we have central banks because we, the people, want a stable monetary policy and therefore have to restrain we, the immediate panic majority, from undermining it. Or we have indirectly appointed constitutional courts because we, the people, want to have individual rights of the minority and therefore want to restrain us, the immediate angry majority, and so forth. Yeah. And so if we have a standard for how, where the balance is going to fall between the popular and the technocratic pillars, what for all of you is that minimum set of constraints that a democratic European polity would need to preserve democratic politics? Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Marina? Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this presentation. I'm, I'm Marina Lalovic. I'm a Serbian journalist currently a fellow here at IWM. I just wanted to, maybe I'm not ma putting the right, uh, let's say, um, perspective towards your observation of, on uh, freedom of movement. You have a depopulation phenomenon also in the Western Balkans, actually, apart from Bulgaria, even though we don't have a, this kind of a freedom. So I don't know, maybe I'm out of uh, you know, context. There is a kind of a freedom of movement since 2009. We, we can travel un, upon three months, but you have this huge uh, amount of people leaving actually uh, apart from this kind of a liberty. I think that is uh, maybe the concept of norm new concept of normality that we are maybe um, um, looking at. On the other hand, regarding the technocracy and the rule of law, I wanted to ask you uh, how come this rule of law doesn't function with regards to uh, sanctions uh, within the European Union? I don't know, maybe I'm here out of a track as well, but um, I was very struck by your observation regarding the populism, uh, because I live in Italy uh, since all, all, almost 20 years. So um, there is a kind of a differentiation between, of course, Salvini and Orban regarding migration policy, and this is the more, most tangible example. Uh, but uh, in the same way, we are talking about constantly about the rule of law. It was mentioned by uh, the colleague from regarding the Western Balkans, but in the same time, we don't have this kind of a rule of law regarding Hungary with uh, sanctions regarding, uh, of course, migration policies. And I don't want to just ask you how does it function, what do you think about this opposite side of technocracy, which is maybe sometimes needed also for regard, with regards to Brexit. You know, you, if, you don't, if you don't have a technocracy for those who actually voted somehow to leave, technocracy, the policies to, uh, to trigger the disintegration or, I don't know, how, Brexit. So, and you don't have with in the same time the um, sanctions so this this is like an opposite side of a technocracy how does it function what do you think about that thank you anyone else I'm not to come back. you are allowed <laughs> to come back Mary. i just want to come back on two issues like stefan yeah. my concern is with democracy and my concern is that in this globalized world a lot of decisions are no longer taken at the national level. So how do you resolve the problem of democracy? I also think there's a problem of democracy because of the nature of nation states, but for time reason, I think it's really difficult having democracy at a national level, really? but I'm all for democracy at local mm -hmm. levels. But I think the way I understand it is that you need a level of global governance, if you like, in order to restrain the things that take away decision-making from the local level. So you need politics at both levels. In other words, you know, you, if the multinational decides to move away and not pay tax, there's nothing you can do at local level. So it's the job of the European yeah. Union, which it does the opposite now, but it's the job of the European Union to bring back decision making to the local level, whether it's through restraining financial speculation, 
uh, regulating multinational corporations or addressing climate change. All of those things are things that the, have to be done at European level because they can't be done at local level and they're what make democracy better. So I completely agree with you. I think democracy has to be at local level, but in a globalised world that's only possible if you have a level of politics that brings back... That's why I don't think of the EU as a state, so that's one point. The other point is the European elections were not between Macron and Merkel. They were between parties. The party of the European Socialists had the most radical manifesto that I've seen for a long time. It was against austerity, it was against... It wanted to reform the Eurozone, it was calling for a Europe-wide unemployment insurance, a green, a green transition, a feminist Europe, a Europe for the many, copying Corbyn, and the Greens too. I mean, and I actually think the Spitzenkandidat system was quite interesting from that perspective because you did see in the hustings, I mean, I agree with what Nicole says about what's gone wrong, but you did see them representing different politics. Me and Ivan were present at one of those hustings and I was really enthusiastic for the first time. At a, so, you know, it was Franz Timmermans versus Manfred Weber mm. rather than Merkel versus Macron. Mm. And that was a straight left-right. And that's what made me feel more positive about the European elections. Interesting. Okay, thank you. So we're going for back to the panel for the final round and final thoughts and responses. Um, who wants to kick off? Stefan, do you want to? Uh, again, brilliant, brilliant questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the first point, you kind of point towards the virtues of technocracy. That, uh, I, I would just not use that term. Maybe mm. my understanding of mm. that concept uh, uh, differs. Because yeah. what I think you argue is that there is a role for independent institutions yeah. in any well-governed society. And I, I will just take the opportunity and use uh, independent central banks as, a, as an example, right? And that is uh, what the ECB now has is the level of independence that no central bank has on earth, right? And it is modeled on the German Bundesbank. And, and that has been documented by David Marsh and, and others that the German Bundesbank uh, was independent uh, and proudly so, but it was embedded in a political system and it acted in response uh, to the actions of uh, German government, uh, right? Uh, so it never worked in a vacuum. And so, uh, therefore, the euro has rightly been described as a currency in search of a state. And there are compelling arguments advanced by economists that you need a higher level of integration than we currently have in Europe, that we indeed need a state for the euro uh, to work. So I also argue, I agree with you, that the EU isn't a state and shouldn't become a state. Uh, but then uh, consequences follow uh, from this as to what to do with the euro. That is an incomplete uh, project. So I just wouldn't call it uh, technocracy, but I totally agree that every well-functioning order uh, has to have space for, for independent institutions that protect even yeah. uh, certain rights and, and that perform their functions better than if they were politicized. Uh, and that takes me then to the point about, uh, you know, we need a level of, of global governance. I totally agree. Uh, but the question I think that is uh, uh, inescapable is the one that Hans raised, and that is, how much of that uh, do we need? What I resent, and that kind of reminds me of, of Schmidt and Grossraum, what I resent is this thinking that seems to be so widespread about many pro-EU federalists, uh, that uh, globalization is presented as, as like kind of like uh, uh, law of nature that that is uh, the condition that we have. I mean, it's uh, man-made, and it can and it's be... it's Europe-made. Uh, uh, and Europe-made, and uh, US-made, right? So th th there is surely, uh, it is surely possible at least to think about yeah. how to, to reverse certain aspects of it. So, uh, and that takes me to the point about the freedom of women. It's not, it's not all or nothing. So th this argument, globalization is the way of life. And, you know, I am a beneficiary of globalization. There is just no uh, denying that. And many, most academics are, right? I, I worked uh, for six years in Ireland, uh, for seven years in Australia. Now I work in Hong Kong. I've never been paid as generously as I'm now because Hong Kong uh, values education. Uh, good on me, right? Uh, academics have always been global. 
And I understand what you are talking about when you say that the Western Balkans is being depopulated even though it doesn't benefit from the freedom of women. I understand it because I left communist Czechoslovakia when it was illegal to leave the country. Uh, so I am an example of people making choices. But there is no denying, and, and uh, uh, there are brilliant studies written about it, uh, uh, Paul Collier, for example, in, in the UK context, that there is a pull factor in migratory movements. So the Bulga Bulgaria has been depopulated more rapidly, uh, my hunch is, than uh, the countries of Western uh, Balkans because it's easier, the exit is easier. And I'm not saying I fully sympathize with these people. I'm completely split on, on the issues of migration because that was my individual choice and I respect the individual choices of all these people who make those choices. What I think is dangerous for Europe is to exclude ever more areas of policy making, uh, turn them into taboo that you can't even race because you are uh, 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 branded an anti-European or, or, or uh, an illiberal or, or uh, a neo-fascist or, or whatnot. So migration should be uh, debated. My sympathies are with the migrants because I am one five times over. That's the number of countries I have lived in. Uh, but I think that there are very real uh, political challenges uh, uh, that have to be uh, addressed, uh, uh, so that, that, that's where I stand. But in relation to globalization and the need for global governance, I think where we might differ is how much of it uh, do we need. You know, just one point that might speak to you, Adam, because you even said that you are interested in China. I happen to live in Hong Kong, right? And there is no democracy there. Uh, people aspire for democracy. And we discussed it with Hans before, before the, the, the session, that it's bizarre to me to hear that the UK will somehow go under outside of the EU, that it has no chance uh, to survive, uh, you know, a large economy like the UK. So what am I to tell my students who want more autonomy or some of them are foolish enough to even want sovereignty, which is to me an unrealistic political project, but the sentiment is noble and the sentiment is driven by the desire for popular sovereignty, for self-government, right? If Hong Kongers can believe that it is desirable, perhaps some of them are foolish enough to believe that it's attainable uh, to attain self-government, then why can't the people of the UK talk uh, or aspire for self-government? <laughs> OK, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, so firstly to Phil, um, yeah, so OK, I guess it depends on how we're defining technocracy. But if, if, we're, if, if by that we mean by technocratic institutions, we're just we're talking more broadly about non-majoritarian institutions, then that third justification, uh, effectively the checks and balances, right? So it's the liberal component of liberal democracy. So I, I agree that that's an important justification. Uh, and, and you ask specifically then what is the minimum? Um, and so for me, and, and uh, so, so I'm kind of in the European context torn on the role of the Court of Justice because for me, um, what's most crucial in terms of the minimum you would guarantee about non-majoritarian institutions is of course, strong independent courts and an independent judiciary. So I can never understand, for example, that in the US some judicial positions are elected and prosecutors too. And I think it's completely insane because it just leads to this, let's be tough on crime by, by you know, giving people ridiculous sentences kind of, it's, it's terrible. So that's where I think that should not be politicized. It's really bad that that's politicized, right? So I guess um, that's my minimum. So yes, of course, non-majoritarian uh, technocratic institutions um, are important and, and are part of a, um, a, a well-functioning democratic society. But the problem in the EU where it's gone too far, and I hear I'm just echoing what, what, what Stefan said, is that the lack of a political counterpart. Right? So uh, an independent judiciary should be one of three branches of government. It should be properly embedded in a political system. And, and at the EU level, that's, that's somewhat uh, un, unbalanced and because of the under, undevelopment or underdevelopment of the political sphere. Um, on, on uh, Marina's question, so I won't focus on uh, the, 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 the free movement question, uh, but so why doesn't the rule of law work in relation to sanctions? So again, you know, that's a really interesting kind of paradox, isn't it? That on the one hand, uh, you have a lot of emphasis on the rule of law uh, and, and EU leaders are always kind of, especially in relation to Hungary, emphasising the need to, to um, abide by the rule of law, but, but where is the actual follow-up, where is the enforcement? So, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's a real problem and a real paradox. And, and I think, as, again, 
this is where law has been overburdened, right? What is law? What are the tasks? What are the functions that law has been asked to perform? So, you know, with economic and monetary union, law was tasked with, you know, legal rules were tasked with bringing about economic convergence, right? Completely unrealistic. Uh, here, law is being tasked with ensuring adherence to minimum kind of standards and values, uh, which I think is a good thing, but then when push comes to shove and, and someone like Viktor Orban really challenges that, there is no follow-up and enforcement, right? So there is this Article 7, which is very political, right, because of the, the hurdles you need to meet to, to activate it in the council and, and therefore is very unlikely to ever even be activated. So uh, in a way, again, then, then was too much asked of law to, to bring about this, this convergence in political cultures. I don't have a good answer on that, but, but it, is, it is a real paradox that for all the rhetorical emphasis on the rule of law, um, there's not a lot of follow-up and there are, there's not the, the ability to really follow up strongly right, in, in cases where uh, the rule of law is being flouted. Just very, final word. just very briefly in response to Phil's interesting question. So I think we need to distinguish between a situation where a polity decides to constrain itself in the way you described, um, and the obvious case would be minority rights, um, you know, to prevent the majority of the tyranny as you described. Um, and, you know, this is a classic sort of liberal argument. I mean, you know, in the, in the history of the US Constitution and so on, this was a, this was a sort of really important debate. Um, that's one thing. I think the, what happens when you have an international agreement or an international rule that constrains nation states, it's somewhat different because it seems to me it's not the product of the same uh, process and therefore doesn't have quite the same legitimacy. Um, and in particular, it seems to me that what often happens in, and what has often happened in the history of European integration is something altogether much more pernicious than, you know, the majority deciding to constrain itself, um, uh, you know, to prevent, you know, minority, you know, minorities being discriminated <coughs> against or, you know, disenfranchised or whatever. It's something slightly different. I'll give you two examples. Um, and, and this actually does slightly also link with Mary's point about, you know, the evolution of this and the causality, you know, did technocracy pr produce populism or the other way around? Um, it seems to me that a common feature of European integration is that what happens is, is that a particular political faction, left or right, loses the battle dom domestically, you know, rightly or wrongly. It loses the battle at home and it seeks to kind of re-litigate the battle through the EU. Um, Two examples. One is, you know, in the UK, since we've been talking about this, you know, in the 80s, the left lost the battle to Thatcher. You know, I'm, I'm not happy about that, but it did, um, around regulating the economy and so on. So you have this, you have neoliberalism, the de, you know, radical deregulation of the British economy. This is the moment at which the British left, which has been defeated, embraces the European Union because it sees the potential to re-regulate the British economy through the EU and through the courts, you know, in other words, so it's not using a democratic process to do it. It's hoping that the courts can impose their will on Britain. Similarly, or conversely, Italy, you know, in Italy, the right, um, uh, you know, was, was losing battles to the left, you know, around economic policy, wasn't able to constrain the trade unions, for example. And so again, then they embrace European integration, the single market, above all the Euro, this idea of vincolo esterno, an external constraint, exactly as you said, Phil, but in a slightly different way. So in other words, it's not so much, you know, the majority constraining itself in order to protect minorities. It's, um, you know, political factions using the EU to constrain domestic politics. That I think is much, much more problematic. Okay, well, I mean, I think this was uh, an extremely rich debate, and uh, I think it's, it's interesting as, as we talk about all this, and after Trump and Brexit, we've all seen the surge of support in public opinion for Europe in practically all countries. I mean, the numbers have reached highs that haven't been seen. And my simple explanation to that is it's better to have this union, however imperfect it is, because we might have our Orban who will go crazy or our Kaczynski. So this is an insurance policy that we're buying to be in a, 
in a kind of country club that, that might save us from this. My other remark, and you know, with Mary we've talked often about this and joked about being Marxist or, or not enough, is that you know, while it was fair weather, yes, we've talked about democratic deficits since you know, King yeah. come, yeah. Yeah. and yet nobody really complained. It's really when the whole yeah. thing took a nosedive yeah. after 2008, when people realized that their pockets weren't being regularly filled, but the inequality gap rose, you know, sky high, the one percent, and we were at best, you know, commons uh, flat or or losing. That you know, people started realizing, wait a minute, there's something badly wrong here, and so you know, the the fair weather turned to cloudy weather, and so I'm simply saying there's a socio-economic aspect to this that's beyond the rule of law and and democracy. If if the EU or whoever our government cannot give me my basic, you know, food and my, you know, vacation, which in Europe, as we know, is six weeks, then something is wrong, and now I'm I'm out there to to get you. In addition to the whole issue of, you know, you read the titles in the newspapers saying 50% of jobs can be replaced by machines by digitalization, and so there's a whole nebulous of issues that arises where the topics that we address today form a key part. But that's my two cents for, for conclusion. But thank you very much for making the trip, for being with us, and please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>